Hello, everyone. Welcome to the closing plenary of this year's Halifax International Security Forum. My name is Michael Serapio. I'm the host of the Cable Public Affairs Channel, which I say because it's CPAC and I don't want our American friends to be confused. <laughs> So thank you for being a part of this, and uh, thank you for being uh, a part of the discussion that we're going to have here that will very much involve you. And, you know, I, none of us saw the video before we came up here, although it really sets the tone incredibly well, because we, we're talking about an air of optimism, it's up to you. But obviously, as we come together, the world is, is facing its own challenges of strife. And in recent history, as seen in that video, even in times of trouble and division, great optimism can evolve and be seen. And to that video, to those who put it together, thank you, because it does set up the discussion very well for us this afternoon. Now, I, I do want to begin our discussion in a moment, but I want to walk through a little bit of the process, because this is the closing plenary. Um, I also want to give as much time as possible to those who are gathered here to perhaps make a small statement if you want, but really focus questions to the panel that addresses the, the issue at hand. And to do that, we, we do have, as in all plenary sessions, have roving microphones. And if you want to, uh, there will be a moment where I will ask you to raise your hand, a microphone will come to you, identify yourself as well as whom you are with, and then you can feel free to ask your question. And as I say that, that's going to happen about halfway through this conversation, but I do want to introduce our panelists right now. Immediately to my right, Dr. Viosa Osmani Sadriu is the president of Kosovo. Michelle Flor, excuse me, uh, Ms. Ms. Sabrina Sakib is the former member of parliament in Afghanistan. Evgenia Karamurza is the director of advocacy at the Free Russia Foundation. And Michelle Flournoy is the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. Thank you to the four of you for taking part in today. And I really want to begin our discussion by reflecting a little bit as to how this weekend began. And, and to that, I'm going to lean in on uh, Peter von Prague, uh, of course, the president of the Halifax International Security Forum. Because when we, when we first gathered, he reminded everybody here that victory in Ukraine must be assured. Ukraine, the war, it must be won because all of the security challenges that face the world right now in Europe, the Americas, the Middle East, Taiwan, Asia, all are tied to victory in Ukraine. And that's because victory in Ukraine will send a message to the countries that are seeking to destabilize the world's democracies, in particular China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Now second, he reminds us, and I'm going to read directly to his opening speech. He, he said, quote, Ukraine has the cause, courage, and commitment to win this war. The United States and its democratic allies must stand together with Ukraine until its victory that will, in turn, give birth to an era of peace and prosperity and new optimism in the world's democratic future. So again, despite the strife, it will, if there is victory in Ukraine, hopefully lead to optimism. But the four of you do come to, to this gathering from very different perspectives. So, so I, I want to begin with the, the premise that winning the war in Ukraine is important and what that means for you. Madam President, I'll ask you to begin us. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let me start by saying that I agree with what you just uh, read. Um, representing a country that was built from the ashes, um, a war-torn society that Today is the strongest democracy in the region, a rule of law champion, and a country that offers a helping hand for those in need. Because when we had our, our need, our need, the world's democracies did not turn a blind eye on our suffering, but came to our rescue. We believe strongly that winning the war in Ukraine is going to determine the fate of all of us not just because it is so obvious that Putin wants to expand the conflict, not just because it would not only end with Ukraine, because obviously they have territorial claims and they want to grasp territories of everyone around them and they look at their neighbors as temporary countries, but because we should not let the bully win. But because, also because rewarding the aggressor with the victim's territory has never in the history of mankind led to long-lasting peace, never. We don't have one single case in recent history where 
rewarding the aggressor has made him, because it's always been a him with all due respect, <laughs> has made him more peaceful or more prone to truly believing in peace. And at the same time, because it's going to encourage bullies around the world. It's not going to end with Europe only. And we've seen it in our region. Just to take an example, in early 90s, when Milosevic, the butcher of the Balkans, started the wars against Slovenia and Croatia earlier, people were saying, well, peace is impossible without Milosevic. He's the peacemaker, so they were negotiating with him. Led, that led to the war in Bosnia Herzegovina. And then again, no one learned the lesson. They were like, well, he's the peacemaker. And that led to the war in Kosovo. More than 100,000 civilian victims were caused because of the appeasement of the aggressor. And many aggressors around the world were watching. And I think right now, so many aggressors around the world, so many dictators, just because they're a little bigger, just because they have more weapons, but most importantly, because they don't believe in democracy and our way of life. They don't believe in human rights and equality. They're all watching. It's going to destroy, I think, everything good and all the values and the foundations that we stand on that we've built after the Second World War. So for that, it's so much bigger than just Ukraine. And again, so much bigger than just Europe. Back in 1999, when NATO came to our rescue, what the President of the United States said that night was first and foremost, he explained to the American people how close Kosovo is to Greece and to Italy. Just, we're just like a few hours away. It meant that the war could expand in other countries in Europe. And a Europe that is not safe and secure means that there will be, of course, a much wider effect in global security. There can never be a safe and secure United States or Canada if there's no secure Europe. But finally, and most importantly, I think it's about values. And it's, for me, this is not just rhetoric. I grew up as a child of war in a society that had never known peace in the history of the existence of our region. And I, as I discussed earlier when I met the Minister of Defense of Canada, for the very first time in hundreds and hundreds of years, <coughs> Our children are the very first generation in the history of our nation that have not known war. It's because those values of freedom and democracy and human rights were the ones that triumphed. So let, let's look at these success stories. The triumph of freedom and democracy does matter because in a region in Europe, we're living in peace for the very first time in the history of our existence. So your work does matter, not giving up does matter, no matter how hard and no matter how long it takes. It does matter to stand for these values and not giving up for those that have always, because if we look at the history of, of, of Russia, with perhaps a few exceptions from time to time, it does matter to stand up to that kind of mindset. And after all, this entire battle between democracy and autocracies is a battle of two different mindsets. One that believes that the people are the centerpiece, human rights are the centerpiece, and democracy is our way of living through which we defend these values, is the centerpiece, versus autocracies where it's about him, it's about the men, it's about grasping others' territories, it's about never caring for the rights of the people. And if this is not a fight worth fighting, then I really don't know what else is. Sabrina, how would you answer that question as to the, the, what resonates when you, you hear that every international challenge right now is tied to victory in Ukraine? Well, I cannot agree more on what had been said by Peter and also in this panel um, by you. Um, coming from a country that have uh, the worst um, case of failure of the world, uh, and we have tasted it, and we have suffered a lot, uh, and there is no worse example than Afghanistan. So we, as Afghans, would like to see the world win in Ukraine, 
more than anybody else to correct the failures, to get together, to make sure that uh, we stand strong against inequality, uh, dictatorship, but also extremism and terrorism that we are paying the price for now. And uh, as if you remember, uh, for many years, for the past 20 years in Afghanistan, uh, there had been a lot of time that we were concerned that the war on terror will be on hold in Afghanistan because Iraq is the priority now, because Syria, because Yemen. The world cannot handle all the conflicts you know, at one time. So I know that and I understand that it was very costly, um, not in terms of uh, money only, but also blood and sacrifice that the world has made, also Afghans. Um, but just because there is a lot happening in the world. So, and because that war on terror in Afghanistan was taking a bit longer, people were impatient and could not continue it. So they stopped it. For you, it was the battle on terror or fighting terrorism. For us, it was the battle for life. Uh, and we are still sacrificing every moment uh, in Afghanistan and women of Afghanistan and children of Afghanistan are paying the price more than anybody else. Coming back to the Ukraine uh, uh, case, um, China, North Korea, Iran and Russia are involved in the battle in Ukraine. Three of them are our immediate neighbors and they are present in Afghanistan. They are investing in Afghanistan, not only in the financial sector and economy, but also military-wise. You are aware that schools are shut down. Madrasas are being opened there. So they are brainwashing our kids, our boys. A new generation of terrorism will arise from that country that can threaten the global security. If that can be put on hold, we wish Ukraine and the world a victory as soon as possible, and we do everything we can to see that happens so that you know, more global challenges that we feel that can threaten the whole globe, not only us as Afghans, be addressed uh, while it's not too late. Um, so just remember, except North Korea, all three other Krings members are actively present in Afghanistan and have diplomatic relations with the Taliban. Evgenia? What would you say to the question? Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Peter Van Praag and to Halifax International Security Forum for creating this amazing platform where we can all come together and talk about these very important issues and where we can meet freedom fighters from all over the world and feel their strength and feel their optimism that pushes them to continue their fight despite everything. Um, as to the question, I come from the country whose government has unleashed the biggest, the bloodiest war of aggression since World War II. I, um, to me, there is no question about whether Ukraine should win or not. And to me, this is very, very personal. This is very personal because this regime has been on the scene for 25 years. And because the war, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine is the result of impunity that Vladimir Putin has enjoyed for 25 years, for a quarter of a century, while committing very similar crimes against our other neighbors and against the Russian people. There was the invasion of Georgia in 2008. There was the annexation of Crimea. There was the testing of Russian military might in Syria on civilian population. There was the second war in Chechnya, and there, was, there were violence quashing of peaceful protests in Russia. The world was watching and expressing concern and continuing doing business with Vladimir Putin. And so, you know, when you look at it, from Vladimir Putin's point of view, if he's allowed 
to annex 25% of Georgia or Crimea, why not the entire Ukraine? If he's allowed to commit war crimes in Chechnya and in Syria, why not in Ukraine? Logical, terribly, horribly logical. A bully, I completely agree with Madam President, a bully needs to be stopped. Bullies do not understand a civil conversation. You know, I, I understand that the, the world, the democratic world, comes from the premise that we need to be able to talk to each other in a civilized manner. This is how the United Nations was formed after the Second World War. So that, you know, it's like with the kids, don't hit, use your words. But the problem is dictators don't understand that. They don't understand a civilized conversation. They don't understand compromises to them. Compromises are weaknesses of their opponents and they're going to continue pushing for as long as they're allowed to continue in this manner. A bully has to be stopped. And this is very personal to me. You know, in, um, in August of this year, it was this amazing blessing for my family because my husband sitting here yet again survived for the third time. He survived two assassination attacks in the past and two and a half years in Putin's gulag and he spent 11 months in solitary confinement in atrocious conditions. He survived and returned home. My family was lucky. My family was blessed yet again, but many weren't. And in early September, there was this family in Ukraine, the Basilevich family in Lviv, a father, mother, and three beautiful daughters. Mother was, her name was Evgenia, just like mine. And she was 43 years old, just like me. And together with her husband, they had three beautiful kids, just like Vladimir and I. And the pictures of the father standing over the graves of his beautiful wife and their three beautiful daughters will haunt me forever. This is why Ukraine has to win. This is why this bully has to be stopped, because Vladimir Putin will only bring misery and pain and destruction. He is carrying out two wars now at the same time. One is a war of aggression against Ukraine, and another one is a war against the Russian population, against Russia's future. If he's allowed to continue in this manner, we will see even more aggression and even more misery and even more pain and blood everywhere he goes. He needs to be stopped. Michelle. Well, it's hard to add. I agree uh, with everything that's been said. You know, I would just say, it's, of course it's true that the people of Ukraine, in their own right, deserve our support, given that they have experienced a unlawful, brutal, horrific war of aggression against them as a sovereign democracy. And on that basis alone, we should be sticking with them like glue, <laughs> not, not, not leaving them to fend for themselves. But there are broader implications. Absolutely true that if the dream of Europe whole free and at peace that we actually achieved for a period of time after the Cold War ended um, and after the wars in the Balkans, you know, if we really believe that is not all, it's, it's fundamentally in our interests, but it's also a representation of our values, we have to fight for that. We have to make sure that Vladimir Putin cannot take that away from us, because I agree with you. If, he, if there's any semblance of a win uh, 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 in this, whether it's a negotiated outcome or whatever, any, anything that allows him to walk away with a win, this will, not, this will be the, one of the first chapters. There have already been several others, but he won't stop. We're going to see him back in Ukraine in the future once he reconstitutes. We'll see him in, possibly in Moldova, in Georgia again. Wherever it's going to be, he will not stop. But beyond Europe, there's also implications. Who else is watching this closely like a hawk? Xi Jinping. He already promulgates a, a narrative 
um, in China, beyond China, around the world, that democracy is in decline. Democracies are feckless. Democracies don't have staying power. Um, they you know, talk a good game, but if we persist, we wait them out, their coalitions fall apart. Look at what happened in Afghanistan, he says. Look at how um, divided we are you know, in, in our own internal politics at times. But so um, this is a signal that we'll, he will receive as well. It will impact our ability to effectively deter uh, a war with China in the future or aggression against Taiwan in the future. And if that war starts, that will be World War III. That will be a war that sends the global economy into recession. TSMC, the chip maker in Taiwan, you shut down their ability to export chips all over the world, 90% of the chips, uh, the world's advanced chip supply, $2 trillion to the, of damage to the global economy, even over and above the fact that we should not allow aggression to decide the fate of the Taiwanese people. Um, so this has huge implications. It has huge implications for the credibility of the United States and its Western allies. It has huge implications for whether we still have a rules-based international order or whether we're now living in a might-makes-right world. So I think the stakes are enormously high. Thank you. Now, we are approaching the halfway mark, believe it or not, already of our conversation. <laughs> so I'm going to invite everyone who who is thinking of asking a question, have one to, to put your, oh, we have one question over there, if we can get a microphone. So my name is Katerina, I'm 15 and 15 winner, and I have, a, I have a question. I am from Ukraine, and I'm living in Ukraine now. The front line is just 30 kilometers away, and my country fights for its independence every single day. My mother is a military, and she can't be with me here. Uh, you speak of era of optimism, but in my reality, with the war so close, it feels almost impossible to find any optimism. What would you advise to a teenager like me, living in such circumstances? How can I keep faith in the future and figure out what to do next? Thank you. Does anybody like to? Uh, I was your age at the end of the war in Kosovo. We were kicked out of our house, which was, of course, burned down. We were hiding in the mountains from shelling and the massacres of the Serbian forces. And we had this little tiny radio with a battery where we were trying to listen while leaders were gathering around the United Nations and deciding about our fate. And it was, it was hard to be optimistic when we saw people dying around us, you know, women giving birth to babies that would die immediately because there was nothing to feed them on, because the mothers had not eaten for, for, for many weeks, families being massacred, so many still missing from the war, even 25 years after. And just, you know, having seen so many wars before, but uh, the world came to our rescue. And I think the unanimity that democracies around the world are showing, the unity that they are showing when it comes to Ukraine, is a great signal of optimism. And I know there are a few voices here and there within NATO and the EU that they might, you know, think a little differently. But the fact, I haven't seen the world gathering so strongly in defense of anyone as they have when it comes to defense of the people of Ukraine and the values that Ukraine is defending. And I know it's, it takes time and it's really hard for people that are suffering a war to, to wait and to ask them for patience, but you will win because there is nothing that can stand on a way of the people who want to be free. Nothing. So you will win. And the fact that freedom has always won should keep you optimistic. And of course, um, my final point. It's the people of Ukraine that will finally win. Because after all, yes, it's important that everyone is helping. 
But what really counts is the resilience of the people. And I have that same hope for the people of Afghanistan. We were under occupation for hundreds of years, not just for a few years, for hundreds of years. Yet we never lost our identity and we never lost our resilience to fight for our freedom. So stay strong because nothing will stand on the will of the Ukrainian people to be free. May I add a point to yes, that? Yes, actually, just... if we have the microphone to there, and actually sure. I did want to ask you because you, you're, you're visibly moved by that answer. Yes, I am. Um, and, uh, you know, the topic of this um, session today, this plenary, made me think a lot. A lot. For the past three years, uh, many of you have heard me complaining <laughs> about the situation of human rights, women's rights in Afghanistan, which is severe, and it should be concerning, not only to us, but the whole world. Uh, but it made me think and come up with a lot of uh, signals and signs of optimism, of movement, of resilience within Afghanistan and also outside Afghanistan. And that could be a very good example for you. Girls are not allowed to go to school beyond grade six. There is a lot of underground, private schools, online schools, girls are trying to find books and read by themselves, connect to the outside world, use social media, um, you know, echo their voice outside, keep their connection alive. The technology helped a lot, uh, obviously. Uh, both us and the Taliban, they are using it. We use Clubhouse and they do so. Uh, we use Twitter space, they do so. But uh, that helped the women of Afghanistan who are locked down as a, like, it's an open prison for us. And even in the families, the house is a prison itself. Um, men in the houses are scared to be punished because of the freedom that women are fighting for. So the families are uh, pressurizing their girls and their uh, women inside the house as well. But women did not give up. Women are still taking risks to go to the streets. This didn't happen in the first time Taliban took over Afghanistan. You have seen the videos. But nowadays, you see women movements, women fighters on the streets demonstrating, risking their life. They know that it's very costly, not only for themselves, but even for their families. And also outside, we have not uh, waited quiet. We knocked every door we know. We bothered so many of our friends so many times. As an example, for the past three years, all those countries that have hosted Afghans and resettled them um, have become aware of what is going on. That's why they stood by our side. The Canadian parliament opened its door for the members, former members of parliament of Afghanistan. It's become a hub for activism uh, of uh, Afghan groups inside the Canada. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, with, along with Australia, Netherlands, Germany, in the U United Nations, they have announced that they will file a complaint against Taliban with the ICG to take them to the court and keep, keep them accountable. We complain about our situation, but we also keep our resilience, our strength, not only socially, but also culturally. Today, I have a beautiful necklace. It's a handmade necklace from Afghanistan. I want to show the beauty of my country to the world. It's not that every woman or every family in Afghanistan are oppressive and they don't deserve democracy. And they, it's not like that. So keep your resilience alive. Do whatever you can. I remember on 19 August uh, 2024, a few months ago, I have attended a program to, um, against the Taliban taking over Afghanistan. And I said, I have a responsibility to be here. It's happening in my time, the injustice. So if I don't show up, if I don't stand there, you know, if I take my luxury at home and you know, uh, do whatever I can, I owe it to, the, to my people, to my nation, to my generation. So I wish you all the best, but I'm sure you will survive. The whole world, we, the women, are with you, and we can do whatever we, we, we could to support your voice, to echo your voice, as we call for you to do for us. We are all one, and we are all suffering from one challenge, one issue in this world, and that's injustice. Yeah.
if, if we can uh, get a microphone over to the side of the room, please. There's a question from the floor. Oh, and I'm sorry, if you could uh, ident ident say your name and identify yourself, please. Yes, hello, I'm Mauricio Mejulam from the Mexico Research Center for Peace. I, just, I, I would just like to, in order to uh, keep the optimism, what would you recommend uh, for actions to deal with the incoming administration in the U.S. so that we can actually match uh, what uh, these, uh, these panel is striving for and not everybody in this room is striving for and actually reach for a practical, pragmatic solution? Dare I ask the American? Yes. <laughs> well, um, one person's opinion, but, um, you know, I think... Um, President-elect Trump has made it clear that he wants to seek an end to the war, negotiate a deal. Um, I think the first, you know, the folks who have an opportunity to speak with him, whether those are his, the advisors he's appointing around him, members of Congress, um, others, I think he, he needs to be helped to understand the, the, these larger stakes um, in, in Ukraine, number one. Um, I think he needs to understand that getting a deal fast is not the right objective. Getting, you know, sort of seeing a just outcome in Ukraine is the right outcome. And that history will judge him very badly if he gets a bad outcome fast. Um, and that his fellow, you know, his notions, um, the strong men uh, around <laughs> him, like Vladimir Putin, will um, see him as weak if he gets a bad outcome fast. Um, I think we need to help him understand how much others are doing in support of Ukraine, the incredible support that Germany and um, uh, all of our NATO friends are providing, um, that this is not something that has unfairly been a burden to the United States. We have just been doing our part. Um, he needs to understand the extraordinary sacrifices and you know what the Ukrainian people have accomplished um, on their uh, for their part. So, I think it's really important to sort of meet him where he is, maybe in terms of um, his understanding, but try to elucidate some of these arguments for him, um, and particularly the, this this ripple effect of how he will be viewed. Um, how the loss of Ukraine could ripple into make it much more difficult for the United States to deter alongside its allies conflict and aggression in other, in other you know, whether it's in Europe again or with regard to the Asia Pacific. So we need to make these connections in his mind um, to help him understand the stakes and to make sure that he pursues a just outcome as opposed to just a quick outcome. We have another question in the back of the room here. Hi, um, I'm Iris from the United States. Um, I've got a bit of a, it's not a Ukraine question. Um, and if, what I sense is a bit of a third rail topic here is around Israel and Gaza. Um, I'm curious um, if the panel could provide some commentary, and admittedly this is primarily to you, Michelle, um, about wh where we are with optimism with that conflict. How our adversaries are thinking about that conflict? Um, and as you talked about, the balance between strategic interests and values and where we are in that balance. Yeah. Um, oh. oh, sorry, wait, oh, sorry. she, she sorry. asked it to you directly. Okay, yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so um, one point of optimism, I'm hearing that before this administration leaves office, there's a very good chance that a ceasefire in Lebanon will be completed. Um, if, if not, then I think soon after the transition. Um, I do think that uh, President-elect Trump will um, also engage early on and with focus on um, the situation in the Middle East. Um, I think in, um, he will try to leverage the greater trust relationship he has with Netanyahu. Um, I actually think he'll try to push for an end to the war in Gaza and a release a ceasefire and a release of hostages. And he will likely offer up to Netanyahu um, his commitment to try to get normalization with Saudi Arabia, which was un being negotiated when October 7th happened, get that back on track. Now that's a complicated thing to pull off, 
Um, but I do think the, my, my, what I'm hearing from people around President-elect Trump is that they will try to make this um, a priority. Um, the huge challenge here is will Netanyahu actually you know, go along with this? Um, does he understand that the tremendous civilian harm that's occurred um, in his prosecution of the war against Hamas as justifiable as it might have started out as, as a, in terms of just cause, responding to October 7th, trying to go after Hamas. But at this point in time, it's, it, you know, I think it's a, it's, it's a mounting strategic loss for Israel in terms of its moral standing, in terms of its international support. This is why you have, you know, as you know, million plus Israelis on the street on a regular basis protesting for an end to the war. You have former national security professionals in Israel pushing for an end to the war and so forth. So um, whether, it can, you know, whether uh, Trump's relationship with Bibi will make a difference in persuading him, OK, the time has come, remains to be seen. Whether the key sticking point is what is the future of the Palestinian people? And because the Saudis you know, will not, they are concerned about how the Arab street will receive this deal. They will not, I don't think, conclude this without a vision for a path to Palestinian sovereignty. The United States Senate, you know, Democrats will have to vote if we're going to ratify the security agreement that is supposedly going to accompany this with Saudi Arabia. That's not going to happen unless there is a vision for a path to a, a viable future for both Israel, a secure Israel and a sovereign Sovereign, some sort of sovereignty for the Palestinian people. So this is very complicated, but I do think this will be an area where the Trump administration tries to leverage its, its, its history with the Netanyahu you know, government to try to bring an end to the war. I have two questions in the back of the room here, and th they will be the, our final questions, just because we're running out of time. But if we can begin in the row here with, and please identify yourself. Thank you. Um, Erica Bridge from the British Army. Um, first of all, to the 15 at 15, congratulations. You give us optimism yes. by what you have done, um, and you give us a future that I think we'll all be very proud of, so, so thank you. Um, can I ask the panel to take out a crystal ball? So you're looking at 15 years plus. That's quite a long way in advance. So if I can ask you to take out a crystal ball in five years' time, and I reckon in that five years' time, the colonels and captains over there will be a lot of generals and some admirals. So we're looking forward to seeing you in five years' time. Um, but what do you see as signs of optimism that can be a positive reality in five years' time, please? Does anybody want to begin? Um, I think uh, the past couple of years, despite the many challenges from the COVID pandemic to the way how we combat climate change effects to security challenges that especially the European continent, but also the Middle East are facing, uh, have at the same time proven that our foundations are very, very strong. It's like the pillars on which we stand are very, very strong. And that is a sign of, of optimism to deal with these challenges successfully in the next five years and beyond. Because unfortunately, I don't think everything will be resolved within the next five years. As we've seen, it, it's like conflict after conflict, problem after problem in different continents. Uh, but for us in Europe, of course, the one in Ukraine has affected us even more closely. Uh, now, um, I do think that the unity that uh, uh, the Western worlds in general, but also other allies and partners who truly believe in democracy have shown in the past uh, two to three years is a sign of optimism. And again, I know there are a few voices that sometimes show different opinions, but they are a few voices. The vast majority of democracies around the world want to stand resilient and strong in making sure that Ukraine wins. Secondly, as it was mentioned, when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, we've been working a lot with leaders around the world. Kosovo is the very first country that answered to the United States request to receive Afghan evacuees mostly women and children, of course. But um, I know that it looks like the attention is not there because of everything that is, not, uh, that is going on. But there is not a single multilateral 
meeting where we do not sit together and talk about how do we resolve the issue of this gender apartheid that is happening in Afghanistan. So there are a lot of efforts and there are so many leaders around the world, mostly women, who do not forget about this and constantly work hard to make sure that we bring the world together to the rescue of basic human rights of, of, of women and children and families in Afghanistan based on the values of freedom and human rights. And thirdly, uh, because I think no matter whether we're talking about Democrats or Republicans, uh, my optimism is simply based on our personal story. It's a, such a success story. At the time when Russia is trying to convince the world that NATO is a failure, democracies are a failure, look at what happened in Afghanistan, my answer is look at what happened in Kosovo. The biggest success story of foreign and defense policy, a testament to what democracies can achieve when they stand together. How about we focus on the success stories of, as well? Yes, we do succeed. We have succeeded so many times in, in recent history only. So let's take these examples and make sure that we refuel ourselves with positive energy to fight for more, to fight for more successes and triumphs. So I definitely believe that seeing the unity among democracies when it comes to Ukraine, there is a lot of optimism ahead when it comes to Ukraine winning the war, and that will have a positive effect everywhere else around the world, including in, in, in China, when it comes to how China uh, will be acting uh, towards its neighbors and, and beyond. So uh, I think uh, we shouldn't, of course, be overly optimistic, you know, carefully optimistic, and it will take a lot of hard work and also sacrifice. Um, the price of freedom, unfortunately, is always too high. But again, it's, it's uh, without freedom and without democracy, we've seen the opposite of it. It's destruction and suffering, so we need to make sure that we continue to fight for it. Evgenia? Um, optimism doesn't come easily today, it's true. But I see the little signs of it everywhere, honestly. And yesterday I was sitting here in the audience watching the panel moderated by Vladimir Karamurza, and that panel included Leopoldo Lopez from Venezuela, Masiali Nejad from Iran, uh, Svetlana Tihanovska from Belarus, and uh, uh, Jeffrey Ingo from Hong Kong. We come from different places. We look differently. We speak different languages. But we bring you the same messages. Mm -hmm. The same messages. And these people who were sitting on that panel, they went through persecution, through prison, through assassination attacks. Masi is living under an assassination threat on a daily basis. And yet, they're unbroken. They're unbroken, and they stand tall, and they say these same messages. They send you these same messages strongly, forcefully, and they make you, what well, they sort of, uh, the, the strength that emanates from these people is incredible, and it's very contagious. Despite everything they go through, they stand tall, and they say, we will not be brought to our knees. We will not stop fighting back. We will fight back for as long as it's needed. But hear us, listen to us, look at us, recognize our struggle. And that struggle is becoming global. And that gives me optimism as well. Because you know we see dictators coming together, propping each other, using each other's methods, perfecting these instruments of repression. And that is scary to watch. I was, uh, you know, when the election took place in Venezuela recently, and I saw that uh, the Russian paramilitary group, Wagner, was sent there to squash protests. That made me scared, because I, I can see the, the, how they are helping each other in the practical sense. The attack on Israel on the 7th of October, I am sure, was a tactic to divert the attention from the war in Ukraine. So we see it happening, but we also see those fighting for democracy, those fighting for freedom, 
for the rule of law and for human rights also coming together and joining forces and becoming this global force of fighting back. This is one, my, this is my, one of the biggest um, reasons for optimism to me, as well as the um, resilience of my friends and colleagues who continue both inside of Russia and outside of the country, continue carrying out an incredible number of pro-democracy and anti-war initiatives. They face incredible challenges, both inside and outside of the country. But again, their resilience and their refusal to give up, despite everything, gives me hope. They're there working on the ground, the lawyers, the journalists, uh, the activists, they're thrown in prison very often. They're very often persecuted or uh, thrown out of the country. And yet, they refuse to stand down. This week alone, 139 people will be tried in Russia in, criminal, in politically motivated criminal cases. And that happens every single week. Um, and these people give me hope, because despite everything, they refuse to give up. And of course, the kids. I mean, we were watching these videos. This is our world's tomorrow, the literal future of our world. And they're there, again, unbroken. They're there, again, despite everything. You know, uh, we know that we're not going to be able to leave them a perfect world. That's not going to happen no matter how hard we try. But they are raising, they're, they're, um, they're growing up fighters themselves. They're growing up warriors and that is a great thing to watch because we know that we can leave this this world in their hands these are the hands that these are very solid hands they're going to take it to good places this gives me hope you know uh, Václav Havel said that hope is not the certainty that something will turn out right it is the conviction that something makes sense regardless of how it will turn mm -hmm turn out. So these people from all over the world fighting for the same things, fighting for freedom and peace and human values, they do it not because they believe that they will succeed, but because they know that this is the right thing to do. When something bad happens, you need to stand up and you need to say, no, I'm not okay with this. You need to fight back when you're being attacked, when you're being harassed. You cannot stay silent. So, and I see so many people doing just that today. And that gives me incredible hope in the world tomorrow. Yeah. Now, I apologize. I know there's one more question on the floor. Unfortunately, we are quickly running out of time. So uh, I invite you to ask it after, after the panel. Uh, but I do want to leave with a closing thought, because the, this is the era of optimism. But, but the, the subclause of this, it's now up to you. So when you hear that, and I'm going to ask for short answers as we go down the row, what challenge do you put out there, not only for the participants in the room, but for democracies around the world and people who live in democracies around the world? What is the challenge if it is now up to them? It's always been up to us. It's always up to. Uh, visionary people, first of all, who truly believe in their freedom and they never give up. And secondly, it's been up to leaders who, no matter how hard, never gave up on the rights of their people. And I think the challenge is that way too many times, because democracies have a lot of procedures, it takes a lot of time until a decision is taken. And autocrats don't, take about, don't care about laws and regulations and procedures. They do things quickly. Um, and secondly, uh, because in democracy debate, even when we differ, is important uh, among autocrats because they join around their own interest. They don't care about these debates or listening to others. Uh, time, I would, I would say, is, is a challenge. It's just taking us a lot of time to get to important decisions. It took the world a lot of time to get to important decisions in the Balkans. It's taking the world quite some time to, to, get, to, important to, to get to important decisions on Ukraine. Uh, I think we need to be quicker 
and more resilient and not allow fatigue to get around us. Uh, at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, I will end with this, many countries will say, yes, but what about the price of energy? Pe people would get so tired, the price of the goods and so on. There's no price too high that we should be ready to pay for freedom. Because when you're not free, n nothing else matters. Mm. Nothing else matters. The price of energy and the price of food when you're not free. It, so we need to make sure that we put freedom Freedom to exist to begin with, mm -hmm. which was denied to so many of us as the centerpiece of our decision making. And then the rest comes along. When you fight for that resiliently, you will also have the good prices of, of you know, energy and, and food and so on and so forth. So just focusing on what truly matters, I think, is a challenge, but a challenge that we will overcome. Sabrina. Um, would you mind if I go last? Of course. Thank you. Of course. You can, yeah. Um, my one challenge to the democratic, to the global democratic community, I think would be to have the courage to call a spade a spade. Have the courage to call a dictator a dictator. Have the courage to call for a change <laughs> of regime, regime change. Because that would be recognition that the only way for Russia to stop being a threat to everyone, including itself, is a democrat democratic Russia is a peaceful and democratic Russia that will respect the rights of its own citizens and live in peace with its neighbors. Have the courage to say that out loud. Have the courage to support those forces that represent this Russia. And they're being annihilated today by the regime because the regime, the Putin regime, wants you to believe that there is no alternative. The alternative is there, the potential is there, but the regime is doing everything to make sure that you don't see it and to make sure that it is completely destroyed. Have the courage to have a continuous dialogue with those people who represent that potential for a democratic Russia. Have the courage to call a bully a bully. Have, to cur have the courage to call for regime changes in countries that represent threats to the entire world. Have the courage. Yep. Michelle. Um, and I would, I would add to that, have the confidence. We, if, you, if we sort of laid out all of the attributes and strengths of the cranks, I love that, you know, and then all of our attributes and strengths as the community of democracies, and we, everybody in the audience had to choose which hand of cards do you want to be able to play? I don't think anybody would choose the, the hand of the authoritarians. We have the best hand to play. The question is, it's, you know, our resilience, our democracies, our love of freedom, our respect for human rights, our economies, our innovation ecosystems, our human capital, our best education systems in the world. I mean, you, the best militaries in the world. You could go on and on and on. We have the best hand. This is a question of political will. And I understand that after 20 years and a very you know, tragic outcome, in my view, in Afghanistan, that, that a lot of people are tired. A lot of people in the United States want, just want to turn away and forget about the world and focus on what they need at home. But I think you know, we, as Amer those of us who are Americans, and, and we ask our allies who can speak truthfully and candidly to us to remind us that we have to have the confidence to believe in the difference we can make in the world and the force for good that the United States can be and must be and our allies alongside us can be and must be. And we, we cannot give up that mantle of leadership as uh, we try to make sure this world goes in the right direction. Sabrina. If you don't mind, I don't answer this question. I skip <laughs> it because it was beautifully answered. Instead, I want to uh, finish um, today's forum in a high mood and remind you that tomorrow is 25th November, the International Day on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls. Mm -hmm. Please do whatever you can. <laughs> when you go home today, Think of it, do something, whatever, doesn't matter, even a tweet, to stand in solidarity with the women 
globally, but more specifically with the women of um, Afghanistan and girls in Afghanistan, who even their voice are being banned to be heard in public, unimaginable. So I would like to go home um, listening to the song that I will try to sing for the first time in public in support of their voice. No matter how many restrictions they will put, we'll break the restrictions and we'll sing louder and louder. Manam manzanam manjahonam kazozodio mehonam to ay ham sangare mehrabonam bapohi zay ham jahonam agar chakmaho bar galuyam vagar mosh ho bar dahonam قسم بر خوشید قلبم در این وحشت هرگز نمانم اگر ساختن صد و دیوار وگر کاشتن چوبه دار من استاده و استوارم ز ظلمت حراسی ندارم منم من زنم من جهانم سرود سحر بر لبانم با خورشید آینده سوگن بر عهدی که بستم بمانم بر عهدی که بستم بمانم Thank you. Ladies, Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all of our panelists over the weekend. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank Stephen Markle, who is our filmmaker, who kept us engaged throughout the weekend. While everybody is standing, I want to thank the Honorable Minister of National Defense, Bill Blair. Thank you, Minister. I want to thank our partners, and I want to thank all of our participants who came from far and wide, from around the world, to be together. Now it's up to us, so let's choose victory. Have a safe trip home. <laughs>